Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Here in the heart of Manhattan is the iconic Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the most important cultural institutions in the world, which will celebrate its 150th anniversary this year with a show entitled Making the Met, 1870 to 2020. The Met was founded in 1870 with an opening reception in 1872 at the old Dodworth Mansion, its original home. When it outgrew this space, it moved in 1873 to its second home, the Douglas Mansion on West 14th Street, where it remained for six years until 1879 when its current Fifth Avenue location was ready. With us is Max Holon, the new director of the Met, a director for the 21st century with a reputation for shaking things up. And if his more than one-year-old reign at the Met is any measure, he has done just that with new imaginative presentations and curations, exhibitions of African-American art, art by female artists, and art spanning different cultures. We're delighted to have Max Holon with us. Thanks for having me. Well, Max, uh, tell us something about your background. Uh, you come to us originally from uh, Vienna, and then... Uh, You've held a number of important positions at museums in the United States. Well, yeah, I, I grew up in Vienna in a very artistic environment. My father was an architect, and it was all these artists were friends of my family. Um, so art was part of my blood. My, my revolution against my parents was basically that I not only got interested in art, but also in business. So I, st I studied both art history as well as business administration, and that brought me into the museum world. And my first job was actually here in New York at the Guggenheim Museum. I was chief of staff in the in the late 90s, and then uh, I ran a couple of museums in Germany, then in San Francisco, and now here in New York. Now, uh, the Met is supposed to be an encyclopedic museum. What is meant by an encyclopedic museum? I've always wondered. Well, I think that's that's a very good question. It's especially a question uh, for this new 21st century. What is an encyclopedic museum in our time? I mean, the idea of the encyclopedic museum basically came out of the age of the Enlightenment. So back then the idea was bring the cultures of the world to one place and ideally uh, museums tended to tell one linear story about it of cultural development. So usually that started in old Mesopotamia and then went to Egypt and to Greece, to Rome uh, and, and so on. Um, I think in our current time, not only because of globalization, but also in, in, because we know much more about the development of cultures, we have to kind of uh, basically admit that this one linear story about cultural development does not exist. In reality, there are multiple interconnected stories of cultural development. Um, and basically, the, an encyclopedic museum of today needs to tell that. Uh, and basically, it also means that there's not one story there are multiple stories, and there's, uh, these stories also might be subjective. Uh, and again, so that means an encyclopedic museum is about the cultures of the world, but it's also about the different narratives about the cultures of the world. Well, uh, the Greek philosopher Heraclitus was famous for saying you can't put your foot in the same river twice uh, because of the new flows. I mean, is that kind of your approach to an encyclopedic museum, that it's not immutable but keeps changing and, and developing with the passage of time? I think not only does it keep changing, but it de depends on from which perspective you look at it. Um, and you, you will get a different, uh, not only view, but actually a different idea about that development. Um, and I think that's something that we will show uh, also our audience, especially in, in, uh, during this uh, uh, special celebratory year, where we'll have a couple of installations that really shows the confluence of different cultures and how, if you, for example, if you transform uh, what we currently have as a med medieval sculpture hall, which is currently mainly populated, so to say, by a European sculpture of, of that time, of medieval times, but if you bring, uh, if you, so to say, define medieval times not only as Eurocentric, but actually you show also what happened in Asia and other areas uh, during that time, you will get a, a very different story and a very different uh, perspective on that. So it's a mix and match. It's a mix and match, but uh, in a very curated approach. And it's also something that's uh, entirely eye-opening and I think also very contemporary in regard to understanding both not only where we come from, but that there's a one joint glo global cultural heritage, but also an ability to, to connect with other, other developments that we sometimes feel 
at first set are foreign, but in reality they are all, uh, they're all interconnected. Now let's talk about Sahel. That's one of mm -hmm. your imminent exhibitions. Right. Is it up now? No, it's no. going to be up again uh, as part of our great uh, celebratory year in the course of the, of the spring. Yeah. So tell us about Sahel. What is Sahel all about? Well, Sahel is a, a very important exhibition on uh, African art, of course, of the Sahel area. So that's Nigeria and uh, some of the other areas around that. And basically... Uh, so it's uh, sub-Saharan. Right, sub-Saharan. And it, uh, what it uh, allows us to do is really bring for the first time, and that's really a typical, maybe also even met, uh, met ambition, for the first time bring uh, outstanding loans from that area, from these cultures, uh, to the Met uh, and share that with a with a global audience, and I think that uh, that also is uh, part of um, I would say a, a transformation of the institution. Um, we have been involved in African art um, in a very uh, important way ever since uh, the 1970s and now the important Rockefeller gift, which then op opened the, the the Rockefeller wing for African art. And that basically was also a watershed moment, not only for the Met, but I think also for the history of, uh, of uh, visual arts museums, because it was the first time that a large encyclopedic museum really showed African art, not so much in an ethnographic context, but really as uh, outstanding works of art, of visual art. And, I, and you will get that also in regard to our upcoming Sahel exhibition. Now, uh, will they be mostly sculptures? Will be most mostly sculptures in uh, wood or in other medium in, uh, in wood and other uh, other medium, but especially of course uh, these sculptures were used in a different context than than we, we sometimes uh, think they were, were. So we will also show the the, the history or the, or the context of these, but it uh, will we'll also show the the authorship and the craftsmanship that's associated with it. Okay. Now another show you're doing is called Crossroads. Right. Now, uh, what is meant by Crossroads and uh, what are you uh, trying to convey? Crossroads is, uh, is basically a, a presentation which I've already alluded before in our conversation. It's, it, it shows you how um, certain, I don't know, topics or, or times can be uh, seen not only as a regional um, um, development, but really uh, as a development uh, that is across cultures. So. Um, uh, one of the presentations will be called Power and Piety, and it will be about uh, sculptures in the, um, during the Middle Ages from uh, Asia, Africa, Euro Europe, uh, uh, late, Ro uh, late Roman, that basically show um, similar um, subjects or similar, they have similar ambitions as sculptures, what they want to represent. They come from different uh, cultures, but if you, uh, if you show them in a, in a combined way, you have dialogues that con connect, but actually also you have a, have a joint, almost like artistic amb ambition that will, uh, will, will, will select. The, the problem of the, of the Met in that context is, as you know, the Met is now 150 years old. So basically the, f the way we are laid out, the footprint of the Met, how our collections are, are, are divided up, are basically part of how the history of this museum has developed. If you, if you would probably kind of create the Met right now anew, it would probably look different. Um, so what we do with some of these uh, installations is uh, some of the divisions that we currently have in our departments, so having Egypt to the right and Greek and Roman to the left and uh, European sculpture uh, in the center, with some of these uh, cross-currents installations, we, we, we mix uh, some of these presentations up and show, again, a more fluid concept of culture and cultural development. Now, when the Met started with, uh, and one thinks of the Met so much in terms of uh, ancient art, medieval mm -hmm. art, uh, and art from eras long since past, and it's so educational and formative, but uh, you're having a show with uh, Gerhard Richter in right, March. Right. Now, Gerhard Richter wasn't even born when the Met started in 1874. Right, yeah. So uh, why Richter? And, uh, well, and he's contemporary. Right, I guess right. he's still alive. Yes. Uh, and uh, so <laughs> you go from, uh, it's almost like a, a, a literature course in college from Beowulf to Thomas Wolfe. So, Right. Uh, uh, why Richter? Well, first of all, that's also what the Encyclopedic Museum is all about, right? We cover all of culture throughout the, the ages, and uh, the Met has always also been involved with contemporary art. Basically, the, the, 
some of the first founders of the Met were, were contemporary artists. Um, the Met was initially also meant to basically also educate artists uh, and continues to do so. So uh, our involvement with contemporary art and contemporary artists has been strong throughout. Um, so one of the important shows, of course, of this year is a show on a contemporary artist. So Gerhard Richter, who is um, arguably one of the most important contemporary painters of our time, uh, will be celebrated in, in what will be a seminal retrospective of his work. Um, one has to really think back in that sense also about the whole history of the Met and uh, that the Met, of course, evolved throughout uh, a long traje trajectory. Uh, when it was founded in 1870, 1870 um, the Met uh, basically didn't have any, not, not, not a single work of art. There was not a, a real location for it, and probably there was not uh, even money, but there was this uh, typical, I would say, New York ambition. Uh, um, a couple of New Yorkers went to Paris in, in 1870, saw the Louvre, liked what they saw there and felt, well, we want the same in New York right now. Uh, and so uh, from 1870 onwards, the Met developed into what it is right now, arguably uh, one of the, if not the most important encyclopedic museums in the world and uh, something that really covers uh, the, the, the world of culture from, uh, from uh, many uh, centuries uh, back to, to uh, also cutting edge contemporary art. Well, you also uh, take uh, what might be called a political slant mm -hmm. in your exhibitions. Uh, I mean, coming up are works by female artists, uh, which uh, had never been done before, at least featuring female artists at the, at the Met. Uh, what's behind that? Was this part of your vision? Well, I think it's not a political slant. I think it's, it's important to obviously um, make sure that we uh, surface uh, both artists as well as stories that might have not surfaced before on, in, on the level that we feel is appropriate. So, so I you're think going to show fashion by uh, Sandy Schreier and right. So that's a, a, that, that's Cindy a, Sherman and right, photographs. Right. And right. So the, so we have uh, on one hand uh, the, the great Sandy Schreier collection, which already opened, is a really a transformational gift uh, for the for the Met as part of our great collection gift initiative that we have on, on the occasion of our anniversary. Uh, and Sandy Schreier is certainly one of the most outstanding fashion collectors of her, of her time. And she made a, a, a really great gift to, to the museum. So we're celebrating that in the show. But we also sh um, are, are receiving a, a fantastic uh, gift of um, really seminal and important photography of the 20th century. Um, and that's, uh, that's the exhibition from and uh, Tannerbaum and Tom Lee uh, of their collection, which we'll celebrate in a special exhibition. Um, but uh, among all of these things, it's also, uh, there is um, also well, Cindy an Cindy Sherman, who made right, art Cindy from Sherman, photographs. of course, and, and many others. Uh, but there's an ambition there to, to also um, not only s just fill holes, so to say, that we still have in our collection, but really also be able to, to tell a broader story about also the art of our time and out of the 20th century uh, and, and more. So that means also that um, we, we'll, like a lot of other institutions, we take a, an, a more engaged focus and it's important to do that about um, not only uh, women artists, but uh, of course we, we collect vigorously in the area of African-American artists. Well, we'll get to yeah. African-American, but uh, uh, 150 years in business is a, uh, a great cause for celebration for any institution. Uh, you're planning a special show making mm -hmm. uh, the Met 1870 to 2020. Right. Uh, what do you contemplate there? So we felt, or we asked ourselves, what should we do for the anniversary? What kind of show would be appropriate to, to tell a story uh, on the occasion of our 150th uh, anniversary? And so the exhibition Making the Met, which consists of about 250 objects, all from our collection, basically tells you, on the one hand, the story of the Metropolitan Museum, how it developed, and some of the more complex developments of the Metropolitan Museum, some of the celebratory moments, uh, etc. But what you see then also in this exhibition, that uh, the development of the Met, so to see, mirrors also the development of New York City, of the last 150 years of this city. And it also mirrors uh, the development of museums in a broader context, when how museums transformed 
from way back in the late 19th century to where they are now. Um, so in a sense, it is a, a multi-layered exhibition. You, it will be a celebration of great objects, uh, of, of fantastic parts of our collection. It will be a, a fascinating, multifaceted story about how the Met was involved during uh, uh, Second World War in, in the Monuments Man uh, in initiatives, how the Met was uh, involved in excavations in Egypt and, and many other things. Uh, but it will also show you actually uh, what museums are right now, what museums have been back then and how that whole thing transformed in the last 150 years. Okay, well I promised you we'd get to African American art. You recently hired your first African American curator, mm -hmm. Denise Morell, a very distinguished scholar and curator. Uh, what was uh, behind your hire of Dr. Morell? She had tried to uh, launch a show at the Met some years ago and was turned down. Instead, she did it at Columbia. It was a great success. I think, her, yes, her, her exhibition uh, on posing modernity was, was a, a phenomenal success, um, both here in New York and then in, in Paris at the Musée d'Orsay. I think it was also a, an extremely intriguing concept uh, for, for the show. More importantly, though, I think she is a, is a great thinker and uh, someone who really uh, has, a, has a fantastic ability to almost like unearth or surface uh, important uh, both narratives as well as uh, artists' works that have probably not uh, have had the same amount of attention or, or even curatorial scrutinization that we would uh, would have uh, liked that to have in, the, in previous times. So Denise will have a uh, uh, will have a, play an important role in that in both in regard to looking at the art of the 19th century and the art of the early 20th century and so forth and uh, coming up with new initiatives both for our exhibition program, for our collection initiatives, uh, for our scholarly efforts and, and more. Um, so uh, in that context, I think we are, we are making uh, great developments there. Um, another example, uh, completely different, would be um, I don't know if you've noticed, but the facade of the Met has changed uh, when we uh, can't help up, but notice <laughs> <laughs> when we put up uh, Van Gechi Mutu's uh, sculptures there, which basically signal, I would say, on the one hand, a very interesting way to activate the the facade of the Met with an annual sculpture commission, but of course also she was particularly uh, selected to uh, to add an. Uh, like an, a new narrative, an additional narrative to the to the history of the Met and to our to our engagement with contemporary art. So, her four sculptures, which showed uh, these uh, four female figures, very proud uh, female figures, a kind, of a kind of a transformation of the idea of the carotid, uh, are, are, are a strong signal and a strong symbol and a new way of uh, embracing and welcoming our visitors. Well, uh, part of that embrace is uh, positioning sculptures in, in the niches in the right. entrance gallery. Was that your idea? Well, it was an idea that I had when I... But uh, you liked it when you heard about it. No, I, it was an idea that I had because, yeah. I've, uh, you know, when I, when I first came up uh, to the Met and when I knew I would uh, become director, so I looked at the, uh, at the facade and, uh, I mean, I couldn't help uh, noticing that there were all these... There were these niches, uh, large-scale niches, on the facade of the Met, but they have never been filled. Um, in the initial uh, building plan, obviously there was a plan to, to fill them with sculpture, but it never happened. So now, m over 100 years later, we basically fulfilled that initial plan. And so it will be an, uh, an annual sculpture commission that will always open in the, in the fall of the year and will be a, will be a great moment of, uh, yeah, of, uh, presentation, uh, but also discussion about contemporary art and contemporary sculpture. Well, the niches, at least initially, will be filled by the work of a female African That's right. Sculptor. That's the Van Gechi Mutu installation. That, that you right. spoke yeah. of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, that is uh, certainly interesting. Then the other thing that struck me is uh, one of the iconic objects at the Met has been uh, the painting of Washington crossing the right. Delaware uh, by Leutze. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, there is uh, an interpretation you're going to feature. Will they, they be together, juxtaposed? Uh, an interpretation uh, that you'll feature by Kent Monkman, right. who was a Cree, I guess a Native American That's artist, right. mm -hmm. uh, in uh, which he portrays uh, Native American figures as well as transgender figures mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in his interpretation. Will the two paintings be juxtaposed? No, they will not be juxtaposed. In fact, uh, Kent Monkman's paintings are 
are up and uh, will be up until uh, early April in the Great Hall, so in a very prominent uh, space of the Metropolitan Museum, again welcoming our visitors and indeed they show uh, a reinterpretation of uh, a couple of different uh, paintings that we have in our collection, most importantly uh, Washington Crossing Delaware uh, by Leutze. Uh, and uh, what Kent is doing is basically he's, he's creating a new uh, idea of history painting and he's basically also recreating uh, a new a history of the uh, of indigenous people uh, connected to that. So I think his, uh, his paintings are on the one hand, history paintings. They are, of course, also somewhat political paintings, but they are also uh, paintings that uh, expand the narrative that needs to be told about the development of uh, both America and uh, the relationship of indigenous people in this country. Uh, so in that sense, they have a, have a very strong uh, message that they are sending. And it's, uh, uh, it's basically, uh, again, a, a particular message, same as Leutze's painting has a particular message. And so we've, we felt that uh, Kent Monkman is one of the artists that we wanted to uh, engage with and commissioned him with this first uh, Great Hall commission. Uh, and he, he came up with these two new paintings. Uh, now, does all this with your uh, accession to the role of, uh, of director, uh, this is a sea change for the Met, isn't it? You sort of it's a turn toward a, a multi-ethnic, multicultural, contemporary uh, accent uh, on what has been an encyclopedic museum. And we have uh, these debates about the proper interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, mm -hmm. Should uh, the Constitution be fixed and immutable and mm. uh, understood uh, in terms of what it was in 1789, or does it evolve right. with changes in society? And, Clearly, your view is that a museum must evolve, right, right. particularly an encyclopedic museum. Yes, I fully agree. I mean, I wouldn't see, I, I certainly wouldn't consider it a sea change. I think that museums are, uh, on the one hand, museums are for sure conservative institutions by definition, right? Our, our task is basically to conserve objects and, uh, and to, to make sure that they are there for uh, posterity. Uh, on the other hand, I think museums are in a constant evolutionary process um, and they further evolve. It comes already from the whole, from the sheer fact that we continue to collect, so we continue to bring in new objects that tell new and different stories, not only in contemporary art, but in, in, in all the art. So you have a constant evolution there. On the other hand, museums and also our scholarships, our, our, our curators, reflect, of course, uh, not only the time that they are in, but also all the, the new knowledge that is being produced. And that basically means that uh, our, our stories, our narratives keep evolving, sometimes shifting. Uh, sometimes uh, we, we surface uh, new narratives that might have been suppressed previously. So all of that means it's, it's a constant evolutionary process. And I think one of my tasks is not only to let that happen, but actually to foster it, because I think it makes uh, the institution not only more important, but actually more timely. It's important really that we don't, as a museum, we don't simply relive former times, but that we live in our time and through that perspective actually look at the, at the past and at the present. So Max Holler and I have a, a question for you. This has just been fabulous. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the Metropolitan Museum in its 150th year going to be even more encyclopedic than the Louvre? <laughs> I think the Met is already uh, to, uh, today more encyclopedic than the Louvre. Uh, uh, as you might know, the Louvre's uh, collection ends uh, uh, around um, in the 19th century because then the Musée d'Orsay uh, is taking over with the 19th century uh, and then the Pompidou uh, in Paris has, has the 20th century collection. So the, the Metropolitan Museum is really the one encyclopedic museum of that scale in the, wor in the world that covers all the all culture throughout the ages. Uh, so it is really a, an, an outstanding and fairly unique uh, institution. For so sure. museum goers will come from Paris to New York to find an encyclopedic collection of art rather than the other way around. I think uh, we get visitors from all over the world and I think, but we also love to visit of course the Louvre, right? Uh, I think that what, uh, what really makes us uh, 
uh, so outstanding is that we are not deep, we are not rooted in a, a particular national identity, right? The Louvre is is the outcome, of course, of an uh, like it's an it's a Napoleonic collection, if you want, right? It's it's m more rooted in a national identity. The Met, uh, with its collection that has been brought together through great philanthropy in the last 150 years, has a different DNA. And I think that makes it such an outstanding collection. It also makes it just such an accessible institution, and an institution that's really a, a museum not only of the world, but also for the world. So uh, our takeaway is the Met has a different DNA. That's right. Yeah. Max Holland, thank you so thank much. Thank you for so coming much. By. This thank has you. just been wonderful. Appreciate and that. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.